Someone once said that every man is the father of every child. It's an idea that my guest has truly taken to heart. He was born and raised in Decatur, Illinois. Over the years, he's worked in a number of community organizations. He served on the Decatur School Board and is past president of the Decatur chapter of the NAACP. In 2008, he started what is now an annual event called the Conversation on Race. At about that same time, his concerns over young men getting into trouble led him to gather together a group of friends and family to talk about what might be done. The result is a mentoring program called Caring Black Men of Decatur. I'm very pleased to welcome to Illinois Pioneers the founder of the group, Jeff Perkins. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me. Here. I've had a chance to talk with a number of different people who do different sorts of things, and I guess I'm always interested in what it is in the background of people that bring them to the places that, that they end up going. And your interest in doing community work and particularly your interest in, in children, where that comes from, and a little bit about you I know is that you had a tough time when you were little, mm -hmm. and that in fact that you came from a single parent home, and that when you were very small, your mom couldn't take care of you. Well, she was, um, she lived at home, and again, I'm, I'm a product of a African-American father, and my mother's white, and at that particular time, um, I wasn't able to go back to the house with her. Mm -hmm. So as I think about even though I grew up in a home without a father, I had a man, his name was Robert Lawrence, and him and his wife took, kind of took me in because they knew my mother, took me in and raised me till I was four, almost five years old. And so in doing that, and they weren't people of a lot of means, you know, they, he worked in a barber shop shining shoes, but yet he gave me that father figure that I, that I didn't have. And so in growing up in a single parent home, which a lot of the, in my neighborhood, a lot of the young men did grow up in a home with uh, no father there. But we always had men in our community at the parks and different places that took time with us and um, showed us that, you know, what it was to be a man. And so as I, you know, as I grew older, I think that's just kind of what I, my passion was to reach back and try to help uh, <clears throat> young men who maybe grew up the same way that I do. And so um, we kind of look at our young men now and we see ourselves in them and that makes us want to um, you know, help them. Did you know your dad? Yes, I knew who he was, but he just, he just wasn't in my life. Wow. We'll get into talking about how would Caring Black Men came about and, mm -hmm. and how he happened to do that. But I just, it, it, I'm really curious about, when you think about that time and this time, is there some something really different about this time now that means that you have to, that you need to create a deliberate kind of effort to make a structure to create those opportunities for, for mentoring with, with boys and, and that somehow um, there were those kind of structures before and they've gotten lost? I, I just think it's a, a culture of, you know, what back then everybody looked out for one another more. It was more intimate setting. Uh, now today's, today I think it's more cold. People don't, you know, they don't get involved like they used to. Um, even in their neighborhoods, I think people don't <clears throat> get involved with young people for fear of, you know, the, some of the things that are going on. So back then, you know, the people up the street were almost like family, you know, because if they saw you do anything you weren't supposed to be doing, it was like, okay, you know, they would chastise you and then you knew when you got home you were going to be chastised again. And I just don't feel that nowadays that people just kind of, I don't know if it's an apathetic view of, um, of the community. And so I just see a lot of young men who, who don't have that. And, and they're not bad. We always, always tell our boys, you're not bad. You're just not following, you know, rules and, and uh, directions, instructions. And so um, you're not bad people, you're just they're misguided and misinformed. And a lot of them don't have positive male in, uh, influence in their lives. Mm -hmm. and, and so those are just some of the things that we try to do because it just we just saw a lot of things happening with our young men that we just, you know, mm -hmm. that we didn't do, I mean, when we were younger. And so I think um, they need, just need a little guidance and a man, a man in their life to kind of Talk, what we'd say is try to talk to them about what it, what it is to really be a man. Yeah. You know, something that, that I'm really interested in having you talk about that you say really connects with your 
interest in working with young men and the creation of the, the young black men. And this, this goes back now, I guess, about 15 years. Mm -hmm. Perhaps people remember, I'm sure people in Decatur do, there was a lot of controversy involving a fight that broke out at a high school football game mm -hmm. involving some young men, some young black men, who uh, ended up being suspended. And it became a national story. Uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson became involved. And you had a very close connection to this because at the time you were serving on the school board mm -hmm. and were the only African American member of the school board. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me just a little bit about what you remember of that time? Well, you know, it was it was a time that, um, first of all, as I as I think back to my childhood and growing up and the community work that I do now, I probably never in a million years would imagine me serving on a school board, mm -hmm. but you know, I was, and um, <clears throat> I enjoyed the time. It was a hectic four years, and uh, toward the end of my uh, tenure, um, this incident happened. And just like in, in, in any other incident, we'd meet for an um, a, a expulsion hearing because of a fight at a football game. <clears throat> and as I sit and listen to the initial recommendation was to expel the young men for two years. And I just thought that that was uh, not very, you know, it was, it was way too long mm -hmm. to, you know. And so I thought about that and I, it ended up, I was the only board member that voted not to expel for two years, two years also with no alternative education. So I, you know, I thought about it and I just said, I, I just don't feel comfortable in doing that. And so that led to a lot of other, a lot of other things happened from that that I never expected, mm -hmm. but it just was just a normal routine expulsion here in which we'd have, we had many before. And when that particular one came up, I just, I just said, I just don't feel comfortable in doing that, I, I received a lot of phone calls <laughs> from the community saying that the, the board was right and I, basically that I was wrong. But again, um, this zero tolerance thing became the cliche mm -hmm. back then. And um, I just thought that that wasn't, um, zero tolerance is just was too strict and too rigorous to, for, them, for them to be able to be out on the street for two years, no alternative education. And again, so I just voted no, and from that it led to a lot of uh, national attention and um, things, but I think, um, I just believed that, you know, you can't put kids out on the street like that and not try to give them some sort of uh, you know, thing. So it was, it was a fight, uh, it was wrong, and they should have been disciplined, but I just thought two years was way too, uh, too yeah. much. I read a story about this, that, that I, and I think that this was in, if I remember right, it was in the, the Bloomington paper. Mm -hmm. And it was, the story was published 10 years after. And mm -hmm. essentially the story said that, yes, 10 years had passed, but that there were still scars, there were marks. That people, you know, yes, it had been 10 years, but people still remembered it, and, mm -hmm. and, and it felt, their ways and felt fresh. Mm -hmm. So now 15 years, is this still something that people think about, remember, talk about? I think people kind of remember it, but I don't think they really talk about it a lot. But I, I just think when things happen like that, I think they happen for a reason. And I thought it brought to the forefront a, a conversation that was probably needed. <clears throat> I think a lot of the things, they were surprised that, at the polarization of our community, which mm -hmm. I still think it kind of, it still exists. But uh, sometimes, you know, you don't want to talk about things and until something like that happens, and then that is kind of just floating there and waiting for a spark to ignite it. And that's what happened, I think. They, they really showed the polarization in our community. And that went along the lines of a lot of other issues maybe in our community, when it came to education, housing, jobs, <clears throat> and those issues. So I, um, I think it was time to sit down and talk about it. Sometimes people don't always want to have that conversation, but I think it kind of forced our community to, um, mm -hmm. to deal with it. Well, tell me about the, what you were thinking about that led to this, this conversation on race, which is now an, an annual event. It's been going on for a number of years, and I believe it, it's, it's a sort of a joint effort. It involves Millican, involves the Richland Community College, involves the schools mm -hmm. to try to get every everybody together, at least a, a, a number of people together to talk about the issue of race. Why did you think that this would be a good thing to do? And when did you start thinking that would be a good thing to do? Because I, I always think that race matters. I think it's a, a topic that a lot of people, again, don't don't really want to talk about and it's a hot button 
issue, a topic. And I just think, I just thought for our community to be maybe a more progressive community to, mm -hmm. to, to talk about some race, you know, race relations that we have in our community, racial issues, and um, be able to talk through them to maybe get, try to some sort of understanding of, um, of one another. And I think it just, in the end, it just makes us a better, um, a better community. Um, I think once the, the medicine goes down and has time to think, it, it, it just comes out and it makes us a better, um, better community. I think uh, Decatur's no different than a lot of other communities. Um, and I just, I just felt like at the time, um, uh, I was president of the NAACP at the time, and I thought it was just, it was just an idea that maybe we could just sit down and have some, um, I like to call it truthful dialogue. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it might not be what you want to hear, but also, I think in the end, it just makes us a more progressive, better community. Well, and did that help to create an opportunity for people to talk with one another that ordinarily wouldn't, just because they, they lived in more separate kind of worlds? Yeah, it did, and, and I think from that, maybe had some other dialogues away after the, after the conversational race during the mm -hmm. rest of the year where people would have you know, time to sit and talk with one another. And again, not everyone was really pleased with you know, coming to the event itself and listening to it. They walked away, maybe still kind of upset, but I thought so many times when you have racial forums and workshops and those type of things, people come to the table and they sit and look at one another, but they never really say what ne needs to be said. And with the mm -hmm. conversational race, uh, with a, what I call a truthful dialogue, I think some things were from the speakers and the other panelists, things were said and some people still walked away a little upset, but maybe they were uh, walked away just uh, uncomfortable, but uh, positively uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were, were there particular things that seemed to cause the most discomfort? Um, I don't know if a speaker or a panelist would also, you know, talk about what white America was actually doing or how they, they, they felt. And this might be coming from a white person. Mm -hmm. I think they kind of um, didn't, I don't know, didn't, don't want to hear it, don't want to accept it. But, you know, I, I don't know. I, I grew up in a unique situation being, you know, product of a black father and a white mother, and I, I've, I've seen things over the years, and I, I've seen a, a difference in how people look at things, because in the 1953, when I was born, in the 50s, it was, uh, I was an anomaly at some time, a novelty mm -hmm. indicator, you know, mm -hmm. and, and now, I think whites have listened to African Americans talk about prejudice and racism on the jobs and, you know, different places, and sometimes they say, you know, we're just getting tired of hearing that. But now that I see more African-American children being raised by white grandparents, I think you come to a better understanding because now they're face to face with some, still some of the stigmas and stereotypes and discrimination and prejudices that um, African-Americans have been talking about for a lot of years. And I think some, sometimes God has a way to bring things full circle. Mm -hmm. And for them to, now that they have, black grandchildren, they, they had to stop and think about, well, you know, maybe there's something to what, you know, someone's been saying all these years about the prejudice and the discrimination that they, uh, that they face. They've been, they've been forced to face it through their, uh, through their grandchildren. And it wasn't like that for me, but I think that's, that's the growth that I've seen over the years. I wanted to have you talk about how, how caring black men comes about. And I think that this was maybe around 2008 Yes. Was it? Okay. Was there something, and clearly this was a, connected to the kinds of concerns and, and some of the kinds of work that you've done in other kinds of community organizations mm -hmm. like NWCP and, and, and so forth, and you had served on the school board. Mm -hmm. uh, was there something specific, though, at the time that happened that led you then to say, to, to feel like I have to do something and I have to get together some people and we can talk about what we can do. Mm -hmm. I really don't know if it was just one particular incident or instance that I can really grab at. It's just, I, I just woke up one morning and of course seeing, you know, seeing the news every evening and being in the community, being involved in a lot of things, you know, I just, it just seemed like one morning I woke up and once again saw some young men on TV in the judicial system Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, I, I sit there and I thought, you know, we ought to be trying to do something. And who better to do it than 
African American men. When I when you see a young African American men on TV, and um, not doing positive things, who better to do that than African American men in our community? So I just I made some phone calls to some friends, and I think I had about 20 men showed up one night over my house. We sat went downstairs and we just sat and talked for a while, and the concept of you know what we could do came into being, and we just um, just made a decision. We're just going to start doing something. I guess we actually got started by uh, going to the, the high school football and basketball games. A lot of times after those games, that's when a lot of the stuff would happen after the games and stuff like that. So we just made, made ourselves visible at some of the sporting events in town. And it was nothing really complex or special. It was just we just walk around and see young men run around, just stop and talk to them, put our arm around them and say, hey, you know, what's going on? And talk, you know, like, like men talk to young men. And from that, it just it just grew. The principal at Eisenhower High School, where I attended and graduated from, was uh, uh, at the game, and then we started talking with her. And she said, "Well, why don't you start coming to the uh, cafeteria at the lunch hour?" So we started, you know, doing that. And then the, one of the middle school principals said, "Well, I want to have a Saturday morning school uh, to help our young men get ready for their ISAT testing in the spring." So we had a Saturday morning, and we'd cook breakfast for them and talk, and then we'd go into the the, the computer labs and work with them on reading and math and those type of things. And then I, then I got the idea, I said, you know, I'd like to have an actual session, almost like a class, mm -hmm. in the schools where we could have a classroom session and bring in young men and, and actually talk with them about different issues. And not to get it confused with, we're not here trying to raise test scores, even though indirectly maybe that will happen if we talk about you know some of our behavior and our attitudes and those type of things. And the, the superintendent at the time, Gloria Davis, uh, was on board with it. And that's how kind of we started with our, our classroom sessions. And now we're in 13 of the 22 public schools. And we see pr roughly about 300 boys a week. And we just, and that's where we talk to them about, um, we're big on character mm -hmm. and the six, the pillars of character. And then from that, uh, if you have those pillars, uh, trustworthy, respect, responsibility, fairness, caring, and citizenship, that you also carry that over even when other people aren't around. That's, that leads to your integrity and to your attitude and just those type of things that we talk to them about. And depending on the, uh, the group, uh, we started out with older young men and now we're all the way down to kindergarten up through the 12th grade. And I think we see how much it's needed just by, you know, when a second grade teacher is finding, oh, they're coming in. Well, can you talk to my young men also? <laughs> so then we get a big class of first kindergarten, first and second graders. So anyway, it's, it's just grown. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, last year we even um, were talking to some young men at Millican University. The basketball coach had called us and said, I got some young men here that might benefit from <clears throat> what you guys do. And we, so we talked with them last year. So it's, it's really grown. And uh, it's, um, the more we do it, the more we see it's needed. And um, the young men first, um, it's funny, the very first session we had at Eisenhower High School was a, um, in the cafeteria, we had about 30 young men in there. And very first day, first time we showed up, and a young man raised his hand and looked at us and he said, uh, you guys getting paid? <laughs> That's the very first question, very first session we ever had. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, I said, no, we're not getting paid. But it was hard for them to believe that men like us could come in and want to spend time with them and talk with them unless we were getting paid to do it. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the second question was, are you the police? <laughs> no, we're not the police. But we were telling them how, you know, we're here because we care about you and we're here because we love you. And so another young man also said, well, how can you love me when you don't know me? And I said, that's why we're here because we're hoping that you'll grow in maturity to be able to do that, to be able to love someone even though you don't, um, you don't know them. And I said, uh, again, that's why we're here. And so we just, we find that a lot of them have a lot of issues, but yet uh, we, we have to be the adults and understand that we have to love them more than uh, some of them hate themselves. Yeah, that's, I, I'm, I'm really thinking about the, what, so often is said about children, particularly adolescents, that maybe one of the reasons that they get into trouble is that they don't think that far ahead. Mm -hmm. They don't think, they, they just think, about, here's what I'm gonna do right now, 
and they don't really think through the consequences of whatever action they're, they're embarked on. And I wonder how it is, which, and, I, and I'm sure that you must, talk with, uh, talk with you know, these young men about, well, just for, for a second, before you do whatever it is you think that you're gonna do, think about, think about that, just, just, just for a second. Really, what does that mean for you? What does it mean for your mother? What does it mean for your siblings? What, what does it mean for, uh, for anybody else who really cares about you? How, how can you get them to do that? Well, that's not easy easy thing, you know, because they're kids, you know, and they, they do, they fly by the <laughs> seat of their pants, whatever, they, what, whatever they're thinking about, they, they just react and do. But at the early age, uh, elementary, we, we have in our curriculum, um, stop and think before you act or speak. And that was a, a big thing, but that carries over even to middle school and um, high school to, uh, mm -hmm. to do that. But we also talked about symptoms and problems. And to get them to understand that they, th we ask questions, well, is this a symptom or a problem? You getting su suspended from school, or you going to the APR room, or you getting, uh, uh, not getting your homework done, those type of things, or doing things out in the community. And they say, well, uh, problem, no, it's not a problem. What we get back to is all those things are symptoms. The problem is your attitude. Your attitude is, is what's gonna carry you and it's gonna carry your behavior. And so if you need to come to school every day with a, a positive attitude, willing to learn and, and all that. So um, we try to get them to understand it's, it's, it's really all about their attitude. And we really uh, harp on that quite a bit uh, to try to get them to understand all the things that you're doing are just symptoms of <clears throat> your attitude. And if you had a better attitude, you wouldn't, you know, those other things wouldn't be, um, be happening so it no it's not easy um, some of them uh, don't un they, they don't quite understand that but we try to give them examples and talk about different things and all of a sudden you know that light will go off and they'll start you know they'll start seeing and then they say well okay I, I see what you're saying yeah this uh, I, it strikes me that that the approach you're taking is is uh, you know to talk about things like character and th talk about things like like value uh, values that uh, some people might say that sounds kind of old fashioned and would wonder whether today's young people would really respond to that. But apparently they, they really do. And do people seem surprised when they realize that that, that kind of approach actually works? I, I think they do. I think today I think we, we try to make everything so complex. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't mean to be too simplistic, but I mean I just think some things are good, they were good back then, and they're good now, and they'll be good 20 and 30 years from now. You know, attitude, responsibility, and those type of things, it never, you know, it never changes. Mm -hmm. I think what, hap what happens is if a, if a young person or a young man in this case is not just not used to that and not getting that fed to him on a daily basis, then he doesn't know, he doesn't know any different. And I, we've had the naysayers. Uh, I see them all the time, and they say, well, you still doing that thing? Yeah. <laughs> they said, "Well, how's it going?" I said, well, "I think I think it's going pretty well. You making a difference? That's the, always the big thing. Are you, really, you think you're really making a difference?" And they already have a negative tone to their, you know, to their voice. And I thought, "Well, you know, if you don't do anything, you're going to keep getting the same, um, the same results." And I, I think if you take time to do that, and I think the, the big thing too is consistency. And a lot of these young people don't have consistency in their lives. People come in and they're gone. They come in and they're gone. As I, the, the young man said, "Are you getting paid?" Yeah. Well, I'm here as long as I'm getting paid. If the grant runs out, so do I. And so I think the consistency has helped us build a rapport. And it's sad to say, will we save all of them? No, we won't. But we will save a lot. And I think it's an ongoing process. And I always say, too, that there's going to be some of them that I'll probably never know. I'll be probably gone into my grave. and. But somewhere, I think they're going. You know, a light will come on, and they'll remember some of those men back there that uh, that I remembered when I grew up. And maybe not thinking about it as much then, but as as I got older, I'd look now and say, you know, maybe that's why I do what I do. And I'm glad I had them um, in my life. You know, I'm glad I had Robert Lawrence in my life because he gave me a family when I didn't have one. And so he also showed me a work ethic, and I watched him and saw him even as a little boy. 
And so I think some of those things now, I thought that's maybe that's why I do what I do. Yeah. That's a good place for us to stop. Uh, I want to thank you very much for spending some of your time with us. Well, thank you for it. having me. Thank you. Yeah. And to those of you who are watching, I want to say thank you for being with us, and we hope that you'll join us again next time for another edition of Illinois Pioneers.